Welcome to Hustle and Flow with Heather Hubbard, episode number 67. Hi, I'm Heather Hubbard, and I was a litigator partner and practice group leader at an AMLAW 200 firm. I know what it takes to rise to the top. I also know all too well the toll it can take on your personal life. So how do you shine bright without burning out? How do you embrace your ambition without selling your soul? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow podcast. Welcome back. I am your host, Heather Hubbard. And I'm really excited about today's topic. It is how to be a rock star as an associate. I have had a lot of requests to do more podcasts aimed towards younger associates. And that's really not my zone of genius. But I thought, you know what, I've got some tips that I can give you. So I've got a top 10 list today. And if you're not an associate, if you're a partner, if you know, you run your own firm, you might be like, uh, this does not relate to me. But here's the thing. If you listen to it, and you agree with my advice, you're going to want to share it with the associates that you know and love and that work for you because they're going to become better associates. You're going to be happier with the way they show up to work. So everybody wins. All right. So we're going to jump in because 10 points is a lot, especially for this podcast. We try to keep it to 30 minutes. So we've got a lot to cover today. So we're going to jump right in. Okay. Step number one, to becoming a rock star associate. Know your ultimate goal. Okay, do you want to become a partner one day? Do you want to ultimately just work 30 hours a week? You know, maybe you want more of a staff attorney lifestyle. Maybe your goal is to just get three or four years of experience and move in house. Now, the partners that are listening might be like, what? You can't say that to people. But come on, you know that a lot leave anyway. You don't have a model that works where they can all stay. So, but bear with me, this helps everybody know your ultimate goal. What do you want to do? Now, obviously, you might change your mind, but you do need to start with what your goal is. Now, a lot of people will tell you your goal first and foremost should just be to be a good attorney and the rest will follow. That's not necessarily true. So heads up on that. That's bad advice. (laughs) That's just people wanting you to do good work. And that's part of it. But this has to work for everybody. In my opinion, part of being a rock star is not just that you have raving fans, but it's that, you know, you have a rock star lifestyle as well. So you got to get it all together. We're balancing your desires. You're balancing the client's desires, the partner's desires, and everybody thinks you're amazing. So you've got to keep your ultimate goal in mind. And once you know what that ultimate goal is, you're going to check everything against it. So for example, if your goal is to become partner one day, depending on your firm, assuming you stay there the whole time, you may or may not need to develop business. And so that's something you're going to want to work on. If you have no desire to be a partner, or if you are wanting to go in house at a certain point, maybe start your own firm or run a business. Well, if you're starting your own firm, you'd need it. But if you're, you know, going on to the business side, in-house, that kind of thing, please don't spend any time trying to learn or develop business because that's actually a distraction from what makes you a good associate. And it's not going to help you anyway. So that should not be your focus. You might say, well, I actually just want to make as much money as possible for three years. And then I'm going to decide what I want to do with my life. Okay, that's fine. That's legitimate, whatever you want to come up with. But what that means is your goal is how do I make as much money as possible in the next few years. And if you're on lockstep, then that's mostly going to be from your bonus structure. So you're going to have to figure out what's the bonus structure. And that's what you're building around. Okay, so step number one, know your ultimate goal and check everything against it. All right. Step number two. You need to identify the keys to reaching that ultimate goal. And this one's a two-parter. You need to know the internal keys and the external keys. 
So let's say that that goal is just you're trying to make as much money as possible in the next two to three years. And so the way that the bonuses work, it's just about billables, right? So that's an internal key to success for you. Well, you want to dig a little bit deeper because to be able to hit those billable numbers to reach that bonus, you have to be the kind of associate that partners want to work with. Because if they're not giving you the work, you're not going to hit your hours, even if you're able and willing to do so. Okay, so there's always a little bit more there to it. But that's why we're checking everything against it. You're going to identify the internal piece. And every firm is different. So don't just talk to your friends at other firms. I know as a second year, it's super easy to compare notes with people at other firms. But let me just tell you right now, Every firm is different. They are not created equal. And the internal politics can be vastly different. So just because, you know, one of your friends received advice from someone at their firm or another firm, that doesn't mean that's going to work for your firm. So you got to figure out internally what are going to be the keys to success for reaching your ultimate goal. And this is where you're going to want mentors and don't just shoot for the mentors that are like equity partners or at the very top. The people that can actually help you the most are those that are not too far in front of you. It's a place where you can make mistakes, where you can ask really direct questions that don't rub people the wrong way. If you go asking some of these questions to someone that's super high up, you're going to get a reputation. Again, you might rub them the wrong way. It's not going to turn out well. So be careful who you ask. My suggestion is you find someone that's maybe a senior associate that is, you know, that probably has better relationships and contacts with people higher up. And you can ask them these types of questions. All right, the second sub part to this is you need to know the external keys. So for example, part of being a rock star associate, if you want to make partner one day, is doing really good work so that other partners think highly of you and want to staff you on their cases. Well, the external piece which has nothing really to do with the firm, is you need to start developing business. And your firm might tell you they want you to do that. They may have programs to help you. But in many ways, you got to get out and do that on your own. So that's an external key. I have seen many associates make the mistake of trying to focus on developing business too soon or focusing on external things too soon. So they focus on, oh, I need to be involved in the community or I need to be involved in the different bar associations. I need to have leadership roles. I need to be writing articles. Those things may or may not help you. It depends on your ultimate goal. So you can look at that external key and it could be that that's a possible key to your success. But keep in mind that being a rock star associate is mostly based on your internal keys. The internal firm keys receive the heaviest weight. Those external keys, don't neglect them, but understand their place. If you're spending all kinds of time in bar associations, in communities, in going out and having lunches with other people, I can assure you, even though you think that you are, you know, being a rock star, the partners are going to think that you are not focused on your work. All right. So number two, identify the keys to reaching your ultimate goal. Number one, what are the internal keys that receives the heaviest weight and it's what you should focus on the most. And then number two, the sub part to that is the external keys and it's going to receive some weight. You don't want to neglect it, but remember the role that that plays. Okay. Step number three, understand your audience and their expectations. Okay, so if you're a rock star, if you are on stage and performing, you're going to understand your audience, you're going to know what they want, and you're going to give it to them. All right, so Justin Timberlake, that was probably his 2020 tour was probably the best concert I've ever seen. He performed for I swear it felt like three hours. And it was an entire it was truly an experience. And he was, you know, everywhere, you know, up on the stage, his stage moved, he kept moving around the entire arena. He had a lot of dancers, his lighting was amazing. He was truly creating an experience because he knows that that's what his audience loves, right? Now, that doesn't mean he couldn't have just, you know, played on stage kind of like jamming out with his band. And, you know, his fans thought that was good. 
right? His diehard fans are going to be like, that's great. But the other people are probably not going to go to another show because they're just like, eh, that was all right. You want to be the same way. If early on you get some diehard partners, they are your fans, they're going to always tell you you do amazing things. So you can't really listen to them because they... <laughs> They're not going to be giving you the honest feedback you need. What you want is to figure out who do you have to win over? What's going to make them want to buy a ticket to your show again and again and again? And in the law firm world, what that means is for them to keep asking you to be on cases again and again and again. And if you're on the case, giving you the best work that's on that case. So how do you start to understand your audience and expectations? Well, first and foremost, understand that your client is the partner. Even if you have a client where you are interacting with that client, your true client is the partner. And so you have to understand that partner first and foremost, and you have to understand that partner's expectations. Keep in mind, partners are human beings, which means they have really different opinions and really different approaches and really different styles. So you can't just get like a general understanding you have to get super specific with each person that you're working for. And so you want to understand their tics. You want to understand their pet peeves. You want to understand, you know, whether, you know, they want you even talking to a client. It could be that if they're not available and a client has a question, they want you to jump in and run with it. It could be under no circumstances do they want you talking to the client, <laughs> right? So ask these types of questions to the extent that you can get them to go to coffee with you or to go to lunch with you where you are asking these questions like, what are your pet peeves? Thinking back of the associates you've worked with, you know, over the last however many years, like who really stood out to you? What was it that they did? And most partners will actually appreciate that you're having this conversation. Now, if they're super busy, they may not really want to go to coffee or lunch, but they should. So ask for them to do that first. If they keep blowing you off, then just try to have a conversation. Don't shoot them an email on this. Okay, that's not a good use of email. You want to have this conversation in person. And then you want to try to give them what they're asking for. And then even if you disagree with the partner, even if you think that their expectations are ridiculous, even if you think there's a better way to do it, your sole job is to just focus on what they want and providing that. Okay. And you might be like, why should I have to do that? I'm an adult. I'm a lawyer. Well, here's the thing. In the same way that the partner is trying to impress the client at the beginning or when you're dating, you're trying to impress who you're with. It doesn't mean that you can't be authentic. It doesn't mean that you can't, you know, bring your own value to the table. But it is a dance. And in this situation, even if they told you when they were bringing you in as a summer associate that you were amazing and they really wanted you to pick their firm, when you start at the firm, they're still the one judging you and the jury is still out as to whether or not you're going to be successful. So, I mean, look, I get it. The whole concept of how law school works and then the summer jobs and then you actually get in there and it's almost like switch and bait. But here's the thing. That's just how this works. You have to basically let them see that you're listening, that you care, and that you're trustworthy. And human nature is just that when you can ask someone what their desires are, what their expectations are, and then deliver, they naturally are going to like you more. They're going to trust you more. And that's how you start to build that relationship. Okay. Step number four, speak up. Be assertive but don't forget your role. <laughs> All right, let's unpack that one a little bit. Okay, so if you see, for example, something is about to happen, there is a mistake that is about to be made, or something looks highly questionable, you don't want to just be a passive observer, right? That's not your job. You are a lawyer. And partners make mistakes. They're humans. So if you see that they're about to make a mistake right? If a deadline is about to be missed, if, you know, there's like maybe there's an error that you see or the client, maybe the client's not getting you documents or you're worried that like something that's in a brief or an argument is not actually right. You want to speak up, but you want to be very, very tactful about the way you speak up. So keep in mind that you're not true peers 
You're not true colleagues. So you can't just send an email, walk in the door, whatever, and just be like, we're screwing this up or that's not right. You don't want to challenge a partner in that way. You do want to kind of think it through. You might even get someone else's opinion on how to approach it. But then you do want to speak up. So if you were just passive all the time and you're never, ever raising your hand or sharing your opinion, the partner is going to start to think that you're not really that good at what you do or you don't really care about what you're doing. And you might think, well, I'm actually just trying to like, I'm actually trying to stay in my role. I'm trying to remember my place. But part of being a rock star associate is helping out and making the partner look great all the time. So if a deadline is about to be missed, if clients aren't responding to you and you're not really sure what to do, so you just ignore the issue, or if let's say there really is a wrong argument being made, then if you don't bring that up to them, And then they're embarrassed by it and you didn't help them out. I mean, they might even say, like, why didn't you catch that or why didn't you tell me? So, again, you want to be an attorney, but don't forget that you're not peers yet. You're not colleagues yet. So you need to be super tactful in your approach. Okay, step number five. Think of your first few years at a law firm as your residency. Okay, so it's an advanced training. You know, when you go to medical school, you don't just get out and go be a doctor. You go through residency, right? We don't do that as lawyers, but that's really what it is. Okay, now I get that given the economy, some people really don't even have a choice. They just leave law school and have to hang a shingle. But even they will tell you they're not fully equipped. They're finding mentors and others to help them. And if they don't have that, they desperately wish they did. Okay. So I think sometimes associates get out of law school and they go straight to a law firm and they're like, I'm a lawyer now. It's official. I want to do the good stuff. I want to do the real stuff and I know how to do it. Okay, you don't. (laughs) I promise you, you really don't. And I get that you are like eager and want to jump in and learn stuff. But part of the way that you learn is through a systematic fashion. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. I mean, I certainly remember in law school being like, why are we doing some of these things? And I still don't know why we did some of them, but it built upon each other. That's what your first few years in law firm were like. It's really a residency where you're going to make a ton of mistakes. You don't really know what you're doing, even if you pass the bar. And so you have to be curious. You have to look at every situation as your advanced degree. Okay, what am I going to learn today? What do I not know that I need to learn? How can I improve my skills with this opportunity? So with every document review, with every client interview, assessing a case, whatever is being asked of you, try to think of it in the big picture, right? So if you're feeling like I'm not getting to do the stuff I want to do, think about how it supports the bigger picture. And again, depending on your firm and how many people are there, you can go have that conversation with the partner. Or if it's a really large case, go ask the senior associate, right? But you want to get an idea of how does this fit within the bigger picture, because it could be you're just assigned to do a document review. And you know, people are just going through the motions. Sometimes with discovery, they might say, here's what I'm looking for. But if you try to find out more, and you can say like, what would really help this case? How does this fit in? You may not fully understand how it fits into depositions, you may not fully understand how it fits into a trial, you may not fully understand how it fits into overall strategy. And so if you can think of it from the perspective of I am learning how this all fits together, and having conversations with your partner or your mentors around that, not only is that going to impress them that you're trying to really figure it all out, it's actually going to help you become a better lawyer. Because if you just go out there and start doing depositions, if you just are going to the advanced stuff, you're not going to actually be that good at it. And by the way, I will say you definitely learn by just being thrown into the fire. I started with a firm where I remember my first summary judgment 
hearing that I had to go do by myself. And I was not equipped. I was not ready. And I learned, but it, I'm sure it was not my best performance. So there's nothing wrong with it. If you get an opportunity like that, by all means, take it. But just know that when you're in your residency, you definitely need people watching over you and helping you and giving you guidance because you don't know it all. And here's the thing. You're going to make mistakes. Let me just share that. You're going to make mistakes. That is part of the learning process. When you make a mistake... You need to go tell someone as soon as possible because people can help remedy it, right? They might be mad, but they can help you remedy it. If you try to cover it up, if you try to run from it, if you try to hide from it, that never, ever, ever turns out well. So if it was an apprenticeship, if it was a residency, you would be asking a lot of questions. Same thing. So treat it as an advanced degree. Treat it as a residency. Step number six, be pro active. Now, you might think, well, that goes against what you just told me, which was I don't need to be saying I want to do all of these other things that I'm still learning and have to do the things I don't want to do. And if I want to do those things, asking for it is being proactive. Well, yes, that is one way to be proactive. But again, that's not necessarily the most productive thing to making you a rock star associate. When I say be proactive, what I mean is I want you to go ask for feedback. I want you to ask for opportunities. I want you to be in charge of your career. One of the things that I notice with associates is they just assume that law firms are going to tell them what to do, that they just assume partners and practice group leaders, professional development directors, people are just going to tell them what to do. And that if they're not doing a great job, someone will tell them, okay, heads up, that probably isn't going to happen. You may not be doing a good job at all, and a partner could be passive aggressive about it. A partner may just stop giving you work. I will tell you, if you stop getting work from someone, you are doing something wrong, and you got to go figure out what that is. Even if you don't like that partner, you might be like, well, whatever. That person's just a bad, you know, that's a bad person. That's a bad partner. That's a bad lawyer. Well, you need to go figure out what their particular issue with you is because there might be a kernel of truth there, even if, you know, they are a bad partner or a bad lawyer, but they're still the partner. So go find out. If your hours are low, you need to be going and asking partners or your practice group leader, or if there's someone that is assigned to give that work out, you need to be proactive and go ask for that. Don't assume that someone is out there looking out for your best interests. Okay? No, you've got to be in charge of your career. If your firm gives you core competencies, if your firm tells you they have certain expectations for you, and yet you're not getting the opportunities that they're telling you you should, you've got to be speaking up big time. Okay. So compared to step number five, if your firm doesn't have that, you should be taking depositions in your first three years, then don't go complaining about how you don't ever get to take depositions. But if your firm says within the first three years, you should have taken like a certain number of depositions and you're not getting those opportunities at all. You've got to go ask for them. You've got to go let them know, hey, I'm not getting these opportunities, right? Be proactive. You will be seen as a rock star when you do that. When you see that something was filed, right? Let's say you did a draft and then something got filed, but you never got feedback. Well, do a red line. Do a red line and look at what the changes were and try to figure out what changed and why. Was it stylistic? Was it strategic? Like, what was it? And what's even better is to go sit down and talk to the person. Don't wait for the partner to come to you because they're busy. They don't have time and they're probably worried, you know, they don't like confrontation. So, But you've got to do that. Like if you need to be running the red lines, you need to go have those conversations. And even if you can't have that conversation, try to reverse engineer it and figure it out on your own. Step number seven, I want you to focus on these three things in this order. Focus on details, quality, and style. Okay, so first and foremost, details focus on details. If they tell you to do something in a certain way, and you didn't take good notes, and you don't deliver it in the exact way they asked, they're immediately going to start like there's points against you. Because you're not listening, you're not paying attention. If you turn in work that 
you know, has a ton of spelling errors or grammatical errors, even if the quality is there, they're not going to care because it looks like you're sloppy and you don't care. It looks like you're being disrespectful. And in your mind, you think, well, it's just a draft. This goes back to step number three, know your audience. That is your client. Would the partner send that to the court? No. So don't send it to the partner. If you're not ready to file it yourself, don't send it to them. Make sure that the information is accurate. You need to double check this stuff. If you're having to fill things in with the file, don't leave blanks. Never, ever, ever give something to a partner with a blank that says we need to figure this out. You figure it out. Okay. And if you can't figure it out, go to the assistant, go to the paralegal, go to other associates. If you have to ask the partner, you can, but that should be a last resort. Okay. So focus on details first and foremost. Once you got the details down, then quality matters. Look, Quality always matters, but if you have quality without the details, it doesn't matter. They're still going to think you're a bad associate. If you've got great details, they automatically think that you're trying really hard. So even if the quality is a little off, so let's say that you got a case wrong, if the details are there, they still think you have potential. Okay, so details first, then quality. And quality means that you've got to learn to be a really good attorney. And this is where mentoring can be great. And if you have other associates that will check your work for you, senior associates who will check your work, that is a really, really good way to get feedback before you have to submit it to a partner. And then the third part is style. So focus on details, quality, and then style. So here's a tip for you. Every partner has a different style. If you can zone in on what their style is and then write for them, give them the style back, they will love you. When you are trying to become a rock star associate, you're not trying to figure out your own style. Okay? You're not there yet. (laughs) What you need to be learning is how you can mirror and mimic the partner's style. So in the same way that a partner is trying to mimic a client style or the way that they run their business, you want to do that for the partner. So that's what's going to take you over the top. So focus on details, quality, style. Step number eight, and I've kind of already mentioned this in a lot, have a safe sounding board. You really shouldn't be doing this all on your own. If you're trying to follow all of those steps on your own without anyone to give you any mentoring or feedback or advice... Oh, you are going to be so stressed out and you're probably going to make a lot of really silly mistakes that you didn't even know you were making. Like you are going to be stepping in piles of you know what without even realizing you're doing it. And the reason I say a safe sounding board, if you come in and you are assigned a partner or an equity partner or someone in leadership as your mentor, just know that that's really about building relationships don't be asking them some silly questions. Okay. (laughs) You want to be asking the like hard questions to someone closer your age, someone that is not going to go run off and say, can you believe this person told me this or that they asked this. So when you think, you know, hey, I'm going to, you know, go tell this partner that I'm taking a three week vacation, maybe go check in with some senior associates first to be like, is this appropriate? I'm about to do this. How would you do it? Especially with this specific partner? Like, what's the best approach? If you have professional development directors, diversity directors, anyone that's there to support attorneys, that's a safer sounding board than a partner or someone in a leadership position. And I get that people will say, I have an open door policy, come ask me anything. But if you're a really junior associate, Don't do that with the high level people, okay? Yes, go build relationships with them, but don't be asking them, you know, so should I be filing this this way or no, go get you a senior associate or someone else who can be a safe sounding board, by the way, an assistant might be too. All right, step number nine, you need to have a self care routine to avoid burning out. If you are working nonstop and you're just trying to please everybody all the time and you're never focused on yourself, the likelihood of you burning out and making mistakes and not doing good work or being happy is going to skyrocket. And if that happens, there's no way you're going to be able to reach your ultimate goal. Right? It's just not going to happen. So you've got to have some kind of self care routine. And we have entire episodes on that. But just know that you do have to practice some kind of self care. The same way that a rock star is going to take care of their vocal cords, they're going to go to the doctor to have that checked on regularly. They're probably exercising, drinking a lot of water. 
They probably, you know, if it's a rock star, they're probably doing other things that aren't healthy, but (laughs) you get the idea. You need to take care of yourself. So make sure that that's part of your overall plan. All right, here we are on the very last step of how to be a rock star associate. Number 10, regularly assess and review yourself. Now, your firm may have regular evaluation periods, and they may even ask you to complete a self-evaluation. But really, that is, that's kind of marketing material for you. When you're doing your own self-review, it's just for you, nobody else. I want you to just be really honest. Am I clear on my ultimate goal? Am I clear on the internal and external keys? Am I making sure that the work that I'm doing is aligned with that? And if I'm not getting the work I need to reach those goals, am I asking for it? Am I happy? Am I taking care of myself? Am I doing what I need to do to be a rock star within this firm? Okay, same as step number six, where I said be in charge of your own career. Step number 10, you got to be in charge of your own self assessment and review. Don't rely upon your firm to tell you. In fact, hate to be the bearer of bad news. A lot of times partners won't like you, but they don't want to put that in an evaluation. So they're just going to not give you work or they're not going to give you the good work. It may never show up in your evaluation. FYI. So you got to go figure that out on your own. Be in charge of it. Okay. Those are the 10 steps. If you follow those 10 steps, you're going to kill it. You are going to be a rock star. And here's the best part you're going to be focused on what you really want. You're going to be focused on achieving your ultimate goal. You're not just pleasing others. You're not just doing what they want. You're not sacrificing everything to get there. These 10 steps will not only help you look great in front of partners, you're going to feel great about the work that you're doing. So I hope that has been helpful. I hope you are absolutely a rock star in your firm. And if you're not at a firm, if you're at a company, if you're in the government, anything else, take what fits because a lot of it does fit. And if it doesn't quite fit, you can either modify it or let that go. But I think these 10 steps are helpful for any young attorneys. And I wish you the best of luck in your careers. And I appreciate you hanging out with me today. All right. Talk next week. For show notes, downloads, and other free resources, and to keep the conversation going, head on over to hustleandflowpodcast.com. See you there.